Part five of Volume one of Plutarch's Parallel Lives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Volume one of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans, translated by Bernadotte Perrin. Romulus, Part two. Now it is agreed that the city was founded on the twenty-first of April, and this day the Romans celebrate with a festival, calling it the birthday of their country. And at first, as it is said, they sacrificed no living creature at that festival, but thought they ought to keep it pure and without stain of blood, since it commemorated the birth of their country. However, even before the founding of the city, they had a pastoral festival on that day, and called it Perilia. At the present time, indeed, there is no agreement between the Roman and Greek months, but they say that the day on which Romulus founded his city was precisely the thirtieth of the month, and that on that day there was a conjunction of the sun and moon with an eclipse, which they think was the one seen by Antimachus, the epic poet of Teos, in the third year of the sixth Olympiad. And in the times of Varro the philosopher, a Roman who was most deeply versed in history, there lived Tarusius, a companion of his, who, besides being a philosopher and a mathematician, had applied himself to the art of casting nativities, in order to indulge a speculative turn of mind, and was thought to excel in it. To this man Varro gave the problem of fixing the day and hour of the birth of Romulus, making his deductions from the conjunctions of events reported in the man's life, just as the solutions of geometrical problems are derived. For the same science, he said, must be capable not only of foretelling a man's life when the time of his birth is known, but also, from the given facts of his life, of hunting out the time of his birth. This task, then, Tarusius performed, and when he had taken a survey of the man's experiences and achievements, and had brought together the time of his life, the manner of his death, and all such details, he very courageously and bravely declared that Romulus was conceived in his mother's womb in the first year of the second Olympiad in the month Coeg of the Egyptian calendar, on the twenty-third day, and in the third hour, when the sun was totally eclipsed, and that he was born in the month Thoth, on the twenty-first day, at sunrise, and that Rome was founded by him on the ninth day of the month Farmuti, between the second and third hour. For it is thought that a city's fortune, as well as that of a man, has a decisive time, which may be known by the position of the stars at its very origin. These and similar speculations will perhaps attract readers by their novelty and extravagance rather than offend them by their fabulous character. When the city was built, in the first place, Romulus divided all the multitude that were of age to bear arms into military companies, each company consisting of three thousand footmen and three hundred horsemen. Such a company was called a legion, because the warlike were selected out of all. In the second place he treated the remainder as a people, and this multitude was called populace. A hundred of them, who were the most eminent, he appointed to be councillors, calling the individuals themselves patricians, and their body a senate. Now the word senate means literally a council of elders, and the councillors were called patricians, as some say, because they were fathers of lawful children, or rather, according to others, because they could tell who their own fathers were which not many could do of those who first streamed into the city, according to others still, from patronage, which was their word for the protection of inferiors, and is so to this day. And they suppose that a certain patron, one of those who came to Italy with Evander, was a protector and defender of the poor and needy, and left his own name in the word which designates such activity. But the most reasonable opinion for any one to hold is that Romulus thought it a duty of the foremost and most influential citizens to watch over the more lowly with fatherly care and concern, while he taught the multitude not to fear their superiors, nor be vexed at their honours, but to exercise good will towards them, considering them and addressing them as fathers, whence their name of Patrici. For down to the present time foreign peoples call the members of their senate chief men, but the Romans themselves call them conscript fathers, using that name which has the greatest dignity and honour, and awakens the least envy. At first, then, they called them simply fathers, but later, when more had been added to their number, they addressed them as conscript fathers. By this more imposing title Romulus distinguished the senate from the commonalty, 
and in other ways too he separated the nobles from the multitude calling the one patrons that is to say protectors and the other clients that is to say dependents at the same time he inspired both classes with an astonishing good will towards each other and one which became the basis of important rights and privileges for the patrons advised their clients in matters of custom and represented them in courts of justice in short were their counsellors and friends in all things while the clients were devoted to their patrons not only holding them in honour but actually in cases of poverty helping them to dower their daughters and pay their debts and there was neither any law nor any magistrate that could compel a patron to bear witness against a client or a client against a patron but in later times while all other rights and privileges remained in force the taking of money by those of high degree from the more lowly was held to be disgraceful and ungenerous so much then on these topics it was in the fourth month after the founding of the city as fabius writes that the rape of the sabine women was perpetrated and some say that romulus himself being naturally fond of war and being persuaded by sundry oracles too that it was the destiny of rome to be nourished and increased by wars till she became the greatest of cities thereby merely began unprovoked hostilities against the sabines for he did not take many maidens but thirty only since what he wanted was war rather than marriages but this is not likely on the contrary seeing his city filling up at once with aliens few of whom had wives while the greater part of them being a mixed rabble of needy and obscure persons were looked down upon and expected to have no strong cohesion and hoping to make the outrage an occasion for some sort of blending and fellowship with the sabines after their women had been kindly entreated he set his hand to the task and in the following manner first a report was spread abroad by him that he had discovered an altar of a certain god hidden underground they called this god census and he was either a god of counsel for concilium is still their word for counsel and they call their chief magistrates consuls that is to say counsellors or an equestrian neptune for the altar is in the circus maximus and is invisible at all other times but at the chariot races it is uncovered some however simply say that since counsel is secret and unseen it is not unreasonable that an altar to the god of counsel should be hidden underground now when this altar was discovered romulus appointed by proclamation a splendid sacrifice upon it with games and a spectacle open to all people and many were the people who came together while he himself sat in front among his chief men clad in purple the signal that the time had come for the onslaught was to be his rising and folding his cloak and then throwing it round him again armed with swords then many of his followers kept their eyes intently upon him and when the signal was given drew their swords rushed in with shouts and ravished away the daughters of the sabines but permitted and encouraged the men themselves to escape some say that only thirty maidens were seized and that from these the curie were named but Valerius Anthius puts the number at five hundred and twenty-seven, and Juba at six hundred and eighty-three, all maidens. And this was the strongest defence which Romulus could make, namely, that they took only one married woman, Hercilia, and her by mistake, since they did not commit the rape out of wantonness, nor even with a desire to do mischief, but with the fixed purpose of uniting and blending the two peoples in the strongest bonds. As for this Hercilia, some say that she was married to Hestilius, a most eminent Roman, and others to Romulus himself, and that she also bore him children, one daughter, Prima, so called from the order of birth, and one son only, whom Romulus named Aeolius, from the great concourse of citizens under him, but later ages Avilius. However, Xenodotus of Trusen, who gives us this account, is contradicted by many among those who ravished away the maidens at that time it chanced they say that certain men of meaner sort were dragging along a damsel who far surpassed the rest in beauty and stature and when some men of superior rank met them and tried to rob them of their prize they cried out that they were conducting the girl to Talatius, a young man but one of excellent repute the other party then on hearing this shouted and clapped their hands in approval and some of them actually turned back and accompanied them out of good will and favour to Talatius, shouting his name as they went along. Hence, indeed, down to the present time, Talatius is the nuptial cry of the Romans, as Hymenaeus is of the Greeks, 
for they say that Talatius was fortunate in his wife. But Sextius Sulla, the Carthaginian, a man who lacks neither learning nor charm, told me that Talatius was the word which Romulus gave as a watchword for the rape. All those, therefore, who took the maidens away, shouted, Talatius, and on this account a custom now prevails at marriages. But most writers are of the opinion, and Juba is one of them, that the cry is an exhortation and incitement to industry, and Talatia, as the Greeks call spinning, Italian words having not yet at that time entirely submerged the Greek. Now, if this is right, and the Romans did at that time use the word Talatia for spinning, as we do, then a more credible reason for the custom might be conjectured as follows. When the Sabines, after their war against the Romans, were reconciled with them, it was agreed that their women should perform no other tasks for their husbands than those which were connected with spinning. It was customary, therefore, at subsequent marriages, for those who gave the bride away, or escorted her to her new home, or simply looked on, to cry, Talatius, merrily, in testimony that the woman was led home for no other task than that of spinning. And it continues to be a custom down to the present time that the bride shall not of herself cross the threshold into her new home, but be lifted up and carried in, because the Sabine women were carried in by force, and did not go in of their own accord. And some say also that the custom of parting the bride's hair with the head of a spear is a reminder that the first marriage was attended with war and fighting, on which topic I have spoken more fully in my Roman Questions. Leaving such matters aside, the rape was committed on the eighteenth day of the month, once called Sextilis, but now August on which day the festival of the Consuelia is celebrated. Now the Sabines were a numerous and warlike people, and dwelt in unwalled villages, thinking that it behoved them, since they were Lacedaemonian colonists, to be bold and fearless. Nevertheless, seeing themselves bound by precious hostages, and fearing for their daughters, they sent ambassadors with reasonable and moderate demands, namely, that Romulus should give back to them their maidens, disavow his deed of violence, and then, by persuasion and legal enactment, establish a friendly relationship between the two peoples. But Romulus would not surrender the maidens, and demanded that the Sabines should allow community of marriage with the Romans, whereupon they all held long deliberations, and made extensive preparations for war. But there was one exception. Akron, king of the Kininensis, a man of courageous spirit and skilled in war, had been suspicious of the daring deeds of Romulus from the beginning, and now that this violence had been done the women, thinking him a menace to all peoples, and intolerable unless chastised, at once rose up in arms, and with a great force advanced against him. Romulus also marched out to meet him. But when they were face to face, and had surveyed each other, they challenged mutually to single combat before battle, while their armies remained quiet under arms. Romulus then, after making a vow that if he should conquer and overthrow his adversary, he would carry home the man's armour and dedicate it in person to Jupiter, not only conquered and overthrew him, but also routed his army in the battle which followed, and took his city as well. To the captured citizens, however, he did no harm beyond ordering them to tear down their dwellings and accompany him to Rome, where, he promised them, they should be citizens on equal terms with the rest. Now this, more than anything else, was what gave increase to Rome. She always united and incorporated with herself those whom she conquered. But Romulus, after considering how he might perform his vow in a manner most acceptable to Jupiter, and accompany the performance with a spectacle most pleasing to the citizens, cut down a monstrous oak that grew in the camp, hewed it into the shape of a trophy, and fitted and fastened to it the armour of Akron, each piece in its due order. Then he himself, girding his raiment about him, and wreathing his flowing locks with laurel, set the trophy on his right shoulder, where it was held erect, and began a triumphal march, leading off in a paean of victory which his army sang as it followed under arms, and being received by the citizens with joyful amazement. This procession was the origin and model of all subsequent triumphs, and the trophy was styled a dedication to Jupiter Ferritrius so named from the Roman word ferire, to smite, for Romulus vowed to smite his foe and overthrow him. And such spoils were called operna, because, as Varro says, opes is the Roman word for richness. 
but it would be more plausible to say that they were so called from the deed of valour involved, since opus is the Roman word for deed or exploit, and only to a general who with his own hand has performed the exploit of slaying an opposing general, has the privilege of dedicating the spolia opima been granted. Furthermore, only three Roman leaders have attained this honour. Romulus first, for slaying Ekron the Kininensian, next Cornelius Cossus, for killing Tolumnius the Tuscan, and lastly Claudius Marcellus, for overpowering Britomartus, king of the Gauls. Cossus indeed, and Marcellus, already used the four-horse chariot for their entrance into the city, carrying the trophies themselves. But Dionysius is incorrect in saying that Romulus used the chariot, for it is matter of history that Tarquin, the son of Demaratus, was first of the kings to lift triumphs up to such pomp and ceremony, although others say that Publicola was first to celebrate a triumph riding on a chariot. And the statues of Romulus bearing the trophies are, as may be seen in Rome, all on foot. After the capture of the Cinenensians, while the rest of the Sabines were still busy with their preparations, the people of Fidene, Crustumerium, and Antemni banded together against the Romans, and, in a battle which ensued, they were likewise defeated, and surrendered to Romulus their cities to be seized, their territory to be divided, and themselves to be transported to Rome. Romulus distributed among the citizens all the territory thus acquired, excepting that which belonged to the parents of the ravished maidens. This he suffered its owners to keep for themselves. At this the rest of the Sabines were enraged, and after appointing Tatius their general, marched upon Rome. The city was difficult of access, having as its fortress the present capital, on which a guard had been stationed, with Terpeius as its captain, not Terpea, a maiden, as some say, thereby making Romulus a simpleton. But Tarpeia, a daughter of the commander, betrayed the citadel to the Sabines, having set her heart on the golden armlets which she saw them wearing, and she asked as payment for her treachery that which they wore on their left arms. Tatius agreed to this, whereupon she opened one of the gates by night and let the Sabines in. Antigonus was not alone then in saying that he loved men who offered to betray, but hated those who had betrayed nor yet Caesar, in saying of the Thracian Romatalcus, that he loved treachery, but hated a traitor. But this is a very general feeling towards the base on the part of those who need their services, just as they need certain wild creatures for their venom and gall. For while they feel the need of them, they put up with them, but abhor their vileness when they have obtained from them what they want. This, too, was the feeling which Tatius then had towards Tarpeia, when he ordered his Sabines, mindful of their agreement, not to begrudge the girl anything they wore on their left arms. And he was first to take from his arm not only his armlet, but at the same time his shield, and cast them upon her. All his men followed his example, and the girl was smitten by the gold, and buried under the shields, and died from the number and weight of them. And Tarpeius also was convicted of treason, when prosecuted by Romulus, as, according to Juba, Sulpicius Galba relates. Of those who write differently about Tarpeia, they are worthy of no belief at all who say that she was a daughter of Thasius, the leader of the Sabines, and was living with Romulus under compulsion, and acted and suffered as she did at her father's behest. Of these Antigonus is one. And Similus, the poet, is altogether absurd in supposing that Tarpeia betrayed the capital not to the Sabines, but to the Gauls, because she had fallen in love with their king. These are his words. Quote, and Tarpeia, who dwelt hard by the Capitolian steep, became the destroyer of the walls of Rome. She longed to be the wedded wife of the Gallic chieftain, and betrayed the homes of her fathers. End quote. And a little after, speaking of her death, quote, her the Boi and the myriad tribes of Gauls did not, exulting, cast amid the currents of the Po but hurled the shields from their belligerent arms upon the hateful maid, and made their ornament her doom. However, Tarpeia was buried there, and the hill was called from her Tarpeius, until King Tarquin dedicated the place to Jupiter, when her bones were removed and the name of Tarpeia died out, except that a cliff on the capital is still called the Tarpeian Rock, from which they hurl malefactors. The citadel, thus occupied by the Sabines, 
Romulus angrily challenged them to battle, and Tatius was bold enough to accept, since he saw that the Sabines, if worsted, had a strong place of retreat. For the intervening space in which they were to join battle, being surrounded by many hills, seemed to impose upon both parties a sharp and grievous contest, owing to the difficulties of the field, where flight and pursuit must be narrowly confined and short. It happened, too, since the river had overflowed not many days before, that a deep and blind slime had been left in the valley where the forum is now. Wherefore it was not apparent to the eye, nor yet easy to avoid, and besides it was soft beneath the surface and dangerous. On to this the Sabines were ignorantly rushing, when a piece of good fortune befell them. Curtius, a conspicuous man among them, eager for glory and high design, was advancing on horseback far in front of the rest, when his horse sank in the gulf of mud. For some time he tried to drive him out, with blows and cries of encouragement, but since it was impossible, he abandoned his horse and saved himself. Accordingly, the place to this day is called from him Iacus Curtius. But the Sabines, having avoided this peril, fought a sturdy fight, and one which was indecisive, although many fell, among whom was Hostilius. This man, they say, was husband of Hercilia, and grandfather to the Hostilius, who was king after Numa. Afterwards many conflicts raged within a short time, as might be expected, but one is most memorable, namely the last, in which Romulus was hit on the head with a stone, and almost fell to the ground, abandoning his resistance to the Sabines. The Romans thereupon gave way, and began to fly to the Palatine, now that they were repulsed from the plain. But presently Romulus, recovering from his blow, wished to stem the tide of fugitives and renew the battle, and called upon them with a loud voice to stand and fight. But as the waves of flight encompassed him, and no man dared to face about, he stretched his hands towards heaven, and prayed Jupiter to stay his army, and not suffer the Roman cause to fall, but to restore it. No sooner was his prayer ended than many stopped out of reverence for their king, and courage returned to the fugitives. They made their first stand, then, where now is the temple of Jupiter's stator, which epithet might be interpreted as stair. Then they closed their ranks again, and drove the Sabines back to where the so-called Regia now stands, and the temple of Vesta. Here, as they were preparing to renew the battle, they were checked by a sight that was wonderful to behold, and a spectacle that passes description. The ravished daughters of the Sabines were seen rushing from every direction, with shouts and lamentations, through the armed men and the dead bodies, as if in a frenzy of possession, up to their husbands and their fathers, some carrying young children in their arms, some veiled in their dishevelled hair, and all calling with the most endearing names, now upon the Sabines and now upon the Romans. So then both armies were moved to compassion, and drew apart to give the women place between the lines of battle. Sorrow ran through all the ranks, and abundant pity was stirred by the sight of the women, and still more by their words, which began with argument and reproach, and ended with supplication and entreaty. Wherein, pray, they said, have we done you wrong or harm that we must suffer in the past, and must still suffer now, such cruel evils? We were violently and lawlessly ravished away by those to whom we now belong. But though thus ravished, we were neglected by our brethren and fathers and kinsmen until time had united us by the strongest ties with those whom we had most hated and made us now fear for those who had treated us with violence and lawlessness, when they go to battle, and mourn for them when they are slain. For ye did not come to avenge us upon our ravishes while we were still maidens, but now ye would tear wives from their husbands, and mothers from their children, and the succour wherewith you would now succour us, wretched women that we are, is more pitiful than your former neglect and abandonment of us. Such is the love which we have here enjoyed, such the compassion shown to us by you. Even if you were fighting on other grounds, it were meet that you should cease for our sakes, now that you are become fathers-in-law and grandsires, and have family ties among your enemies. If, however, the war is on our behalf, carry us away with your sons-in-law and their children, and so restore to us our fathers and kindred, but do not rob us of our children and husbands." Let us not, we beseech you, become prisoners of war again. Many such appeals were made by Hercilia, and the other women added their entreaties, 
until a truce was made, and the leaders held a conference. Meanwhile, the women brought their husbands and their children, and presented them to their fathers and brothers. They also carried food and drink to those that wanted, and bore the wounded to their homes for tender nursing. Here they also made it evident that they were mistresses of their own households, and that their husbands were attentive to them, and showed them all honour with good will. Thereupon agreements were made that such women as wished to do so might continue to live with their husbands, exempt, as aforesaid, from all labour and all drudgery except spinning. Also that the city should be inhabited by Romans and Sabines in common, and that the city should be called Rome from Romulus, but all its citizens Quirites from the native city of Tatius, and that Romulus and Tatius should be joint kings and leaders of the army. The place where these agreements were made is to this day called Comitium, from the Roman word conire or coire, to come together. End of Romulus Part Two.